So my talk is not necessarily going to be entirely limited to uh, finance. It, it's going to be about IoT in general, and uh, I think applicability to finance is there as well. Uh, and I'm going to give you some, uh, basically, introduction to IoT uh, standards, etc. Then I'll talk about enterprise IoT or industrial IoT, as it's being called sometimes. And we'll talk about the uh, distinctions between that and regular IoT. And then I'll, I'll show some enterprise patterns that could apply. Uh, so as uh, was mentioned before, I invented this thing, Publish, Subscribe. One of the most uh, intriguing things is that all the IoT protocols uh, support Publish, Subscribe. It's become the standard. Uh, and finance was the industry that led, uh, as Asanka had mentioned, led the creation of Publish, Subscribe as the paradigm. And so it's, it's quite satisfying to me, having <laughs> gotten the patent and the original idea of Publish, Subscribe, that it's now the common way in which all IoT devices will communicate. It makes a lot of sense. There's a, there's a lot of reasons why the IoT uh, devices and, and infrastructure work that way. Uh, a trading floor consists of a bunch of different groups of, of people who are all interested in different information. And they, uh, if you're talking about traders in particular, they all get different information that they process. But when they do a trade, also that trade goes to many organizations which have a lot of interest in that activity. So, the publish subscribe paradigm has the notion that there could be any number of subscribers and that you can discover later what the value of the data or that particular message is. In the IoT world, you could be constantly putting IoT devices in and out. Uh, the, the data could be used by any number of applications you don't know in advance. You can't configure these things always in advance. So you need a flexible architecture. And uh, that's why everybody went to, I guess, publish, subscribe. It's, it's a very flexible, loosely coupled way to connect a lot of devices and have them recognize each other and, and discover each other. So there's been an enormous hype around this whole IoT space. And uh, you know, here's one diagram that shows you a, uh, a little bit of a picture of uh, how big this area is. And uh, part of the problem is the definition of IoT. So there's a lot of stuff that we've done in the past that we didn't call IoT uh, that, that is there in buildings and in, in all over the place. Sometimes they didn't connect to IP, but now you put a connector in and suddenly all those devices become available to the internet or to, to IP-oriented uh, type applications, and we call them IoT. A lot of people are just trying to jump on the bandwagon. So it kind of artificially inflates the, the overall size. If we look at just like the watch market or something like that, it looks silly. I mean, to, to claim trillions of dollars. But the fact is that if you look at what people are doing with uh, these IoTs and what's happening around medical, around uh, the new things that are happening in energy and, and everything that's happening in uh, you know, the home, et cetera, it's, it, it is truly enormous and it is groundbreaking. An analogy I like to use is that uh, when Apple came out with the phone in 2007, they introduced the App Store. And maybe some people didn't quite comprehend the value of the App Store initially, but the entrepreneurs certainly did. 600,000 apps in two years. There was an incredible explosion of excitement and uh, you know, people thinking they're going to be millionaires, I guess, building apps or just that they were useful. Well, the very same thing's happening in, in this IoT world, but like on a scale much, much bigger. <laughs> There's hobbyists and you know, maker fairs and all these things going on. Everywhere you turn, somebody's building a device, either at home, I have a friend who's modifying his lawnmowers. You know, I mean, people are just playing with this stuff like crazy. It's, it's an enormous uh, uh, thing that is attracting uh, a huge variety of players. And I think the, the level of creativity that's allowed uh, by all the technology we have today means that even smaller players can do disruptive things, come up with disruptive ideas for how you use IoT. So it's, it's pretty exciting, I think, to a lot of people. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, Sand Hill Road in Palo Alto, you know, et cetera, is, is spending money and getting invested in this. So I, I believe we're going to have a lot of technology. And in the industrial sector in particular, there's an... It's, it's, a, it's a given to me that factories, enterprises, everybody will be uh, just completely connected and all their devices and, and everything. So uh, I have divided, this is my own segmentation, I've divided the hardware part 
in this, and I'm less interested in the hardware part because I'm a software engineer. Of course, I'm very interested in the hardware uh, stuff personally, uh, and I have uh, you know uh, some some of these IoT devices at home I play with and stuff. I write a blog and I talk about a lot of this stuff as well as the industrial side of things, so you might be interested in looking at that. Anyway, so on the hardware side, there is a segmentation of, of the, the various kinds of hardware and software pieces that go into the actual devices themselves and the, and the hubs. But what I'm more interested in is the software side uh, on uh, you know, the server side or in, the, in how people orchestrate or manage or, or utilize. And I think that's the real value of IoT is that... Uh, Having one IoT device that you can send a message to and have an app that you can talk to to turn a switch on and off is quite geeky and stupid, really. <laughs> so I, I tell the story how I actually completely IoT'd my home in 1986, 1987, like 20 years ago. I had completely uh, turned all my switches, my, my thermostat, everything into a complete electronic uh, controllable thing. Uh, so I went down this road. It was real fun. Uh, I, could, <laughs> I could do things like turn peop, peop, the lights off in the bathroom when people were in the bathroom and freak them out. <laughs> I could, I could have set up them, you know, party scenes and, and have all the... And I, I programmed this. I could dial in from a modem externally and, and call into my house and do commands on the house. It, it, was, it was fun. Uh, but I never did it to my following houses. Uh, all the second houses and stuff, I never made the effort to do that. Uh, but the value of IoT comes from the fact that they're all connected and that they, uh, th that they work together. And that's what's really happening in today's world, where we're able, through IP, to orchestrate these devices, gather more information, and do intelligent things beyond just turning a light on and off. Uh, so. What's happened is we have this, um, people see this, see this vision of what IoT is, and there's uh, an incredible um, segmentation already occurring in the market that you can see. So there's companies out there that are just helping you with keeping track of your devices, uh, and the t the abstractly just the total devices, all the devices out in the world, uh, and so there's a whole series of companies that just deal with the issue of like, what is a device? What, is it, what does it deal? What, what kind of information does it send or receive? What kind of things can it control? Uh, just abstractly, what is the taxonomy of all these devices? Health, medical devices, etc. Uh, and then even tries to, so for instance, everything, you can, you can take anything which is even connected to an IoT device, so, for instance, if you have uh, one of these tiles, I have this a tile device, it's a little IoT device you attach to anything. You can put it on your keys or whatever, and it, and it will track your keys so you never lose your keys again. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, you can then go to everything and put your keys as an IoT device. Because it's attached to the tile, you can say it's an IoT device. So you can basically create this device abstraction around every, every device you have and, and every device that exists. Uh, then there are companies that are focused on just the storage of information and the analysis of that information. But sometimes just the storage, sometimes the storage and analysis. So they're focusing on just trying to be, because everybody's expecting the data growth from all of this IoT stuff to be explosive, to be unbelievable. They're saying that it makes the internet, the current cloud internet data look trivial, right? It's going to explode by factors of millions <laughs> because all of these IoT devices creating data will, will overwhelm things. So there's a lot of companies focusing on just that aspect. Pub-sub platforms. Interestingly, since the IoT devices are all pub-sub, some people are extending that analogy to the cloud and saying, if you've got a little rat that's running a roller coaster and you have a little clock, a timer on there that's counting the, the things, well, if you want to report to the world through a Twitter message that uh, you know, the, the rat has run a mile, <laughs> such things exist. And you can, you can find that, and you can do create a publish. Or you could do other more, you know, uh, industrial things, I suppose, with it. But uh, these pub-sub platforms allow you to connect and to extend the, the paradigm of the, uh, the, the pub-sub of the devices themselves out to the cloud. Uh, there's companies that really focus on the analysis, trying to understand, for instance, energy. Or, uh, you know, there's, there's devices they figured out that just by looking at your energy uses in detail, they can actually calculate which devices, looking at the, the, how the devices use energy, they can actually figure out through big data which devices are turned on and off at every point without having to have a monitor on every device, just by looking at the signature in the wave function of the, of, of the energy use. So 
There have been other companies that are looking at how to more efficiently do things. Eventually, this is an enormous thing when we get to health and stuff. There's a huge amount. But there's a lot of companies right now that are focused on just efficiency. Uh, visualization. There's many companies now that are focused on just providing good visualization tools, dashboards, controls. Some of them are hardware. Some of them are just purely software. Some of them run as an app you can configure on your little phone or whatever. Uh, these, they're also segmented by industrial consumer hobbyist is the way I've figured this out, is there are companies that are very focused on the industrial sector, companies that are very focused on the consumer sector, and companies that are very focused on the hobbyist sector. So uh, that's another slice on all this, because each of these areas has those three segments. And then, uh, visual, so then integration is the big space. So a lot of companies are focused on this integration space or orchestration, whatever you want to call it. But it's the idea of like, how do you, how do you make all these devices play together? What is the rules that you use for defining uh, how things work and what happens with these devices? And, and it can be quite complicated. And there's a, you know, there's a discussion. I've noticed that some of the companies use a rules engine, literally, use like Jules as the orchestration tool. Other people use uh, an ESB as, a, as the tool. And other people have been using business process orchestration. So there's a, quite a dispute as to you know, what, uh, what is the proper tool to do orchestration for IoT. Uh, IFTT is, uh, TTT has come up with an entirely sort of an ESB-like model, uh, but it's a new model, and it's a really excellent model that you know, is very simple uh, to use. And so they have, they have uh, their own approach. Uh, we have a couple of companies, Pacific Controls and Trimble, who are building industrial integrated, integrated platforms that are quite impressive. Um, of course, they're building it on the WSO2 stack, and the great advantage of the WSO2 stack is that it has everything. We have a rules engine, we have the uh, ESB, and we have business process. So you can choose, and you can even segregate the, uh, some of the, the, the uh, uh, actions and orchestration using the appropriate tool. So that's, that's quite powerful. Um, but probably uh, for consumer, it wouldn't make sense, unless it was packaged as a product. As, and, for an industrial or, you know, organization, it might make sense. There's also companies just focused on providing services. So I'm probably going to go over if I... 13 minutes, okay. Uh, that's what that's telling me, right? Uh, so I'm going to have to go through some of the slides a little bit faster. But um, one of the things I found fascinating is looking at the personas of the people who are doing IoT right now. It's very exciting. There's a, all these groups that uh, people are uh, identifying. Uh, these are different within various companies of all sizes, within new startups, within consumers, there are all these different personas of people who are really interested in IoT. And when you get that, you realize how big this is, that so many people are interested in this from many different angles. The main business drivers of IoT that is, that is pushing this is cost reductions, increased quality, if you're talking about factories or you know, in, in, the, in the enterprise. Uh, for some people, it's a matter of stickiness. You know, by attaching themselves to the IoT device and to the consumer, they can get more presence, more, uh, more ability to interact with the, with the consumer, uh, and just to create new products. Uh, there's some best practices that I think aren't being followed very well in many of the cases. For instance, you know, encrypting the data at rest and in motion. A lot of the devices don't encrypt, uh, especially the consumer side. But even some of the industrial applications aren't really uh, don't really have a, a top grade security. And one of the problems is that, and I'll talk about security more, it, one of the big problems is that um, the devices uh, don't uniformly have a way to upgrade themselves. There's no, uh, no easy way to, for instance, find out if a device needs to be upgraded. So if, there's a, if it turns out there's a hole in that device uh, that somebody discovers a vulnerability, um, who knows if anybody will patch it, when they'll patch it, if they'll patch it. You need device management, and there are new standards around device management that are being created, but for many people, there will probably not be much device management, and even in those cases, it's not necessarily automated or easy that it could be done. So, uh, you know, this is a big area uh, of concern is around the security of these IoT devices. In the industrial space, where we've got more, more stuff happening. So there's a, lot of tech, there's a lot of words in here, a lot of uh, stuff you could read if you get to the slide. Uh, later. So there's four groups that are trying to uh, come up with standards in the IoT space. And uh, one of them, the IOC, uh, is probably the prominent one, I think. Uh, they, they're uh, uh, pushing for a lot of stuff around the discovery layer and in some of the uh, 
some of the protocols, all of these uh, various standards organizations, which there are probably about 500 to 1,000 companies are aligned or in all of these groups, uh, are trying to create standards mostly at the lower layers of the protocol and the discovery stack. So what people haven't done is they haven't really thought about, well, how do you orchestrate this stuff? How do you actually handle all this data? How do you do... There, there's no standards, no tools that have been really built that are really standardizing all of this. And that, that's... So that, the standardization efforts is mostly in this lower level. But it's important because there's where a lot of times the security and, and other things uh, happen. Uh, Apple is a big player that hasn't introduced their standard yet. I mean, they just came out with HomeKit. But uh, I feel they will have a tremendous... As they usually do, have a tremendous impact. And since they haven't announced exactly everything in their product stack and how it's going to work, you know, uh, to me it raises a real question whether any of these are relevant because until we know what they want to do, and they tend to be pretty proprietary and pretty, decide pretty much what they, they want to do uh, themselves. So I think it's a big question mark in the whole thing, which is uh, creating problems. Uh, there's a Google effort that's really interesting uh, that uh, they have defined a, a low-level protocol, and they're working with Zigbee to create some standards around the, the devices themselves. And uh, so all of these groups, I'm not sure that they're really competing. It's not been shown yet that they're competing from the point of view of trying to you know, outdo each other or uh, create separate standards that are incompatible that manufacturers would have to align to or the devices would have to align to. So it could very well be that these standards end up being coming uh, very consistent with each other and that, you know, it's, it's, it's great that they're all just pushing for the same thing. Hopefully that's how it's going to work out. <laughs> but uh, as I said, there's an enormous number of points of problems with IoT devices. One of the ones, for instance, is they don't really uh, authenticate themselves. So you can, you can easily uh, replace a device, come in and, and just pretend to be a device in the network, so it's not a very uh, it's not a very good security system because you can obviously just go in and do that. And, and the whole there's there's things here we don't actually even know how to do, uh, probably in terms of the security that's still being worked out. So that's part of the problem. Uh, there's also the issue of uh, making it easy for consumers and the industry. And uh, so there's a group I belong to called OMA or UMA, which is creating a uh, OAuth 2 standard for policies, so you can create policies around how, or how different devices can interact, who can see what in the device. So as, it would mean that, for instance, that taking the analogy to the home or the business, so when, when you go into your home, you expect to get access to certain devices and be able to do certain actions. If a friend walks in that you know, or a family member, you know, maybe they have a very similar set of types of things, maybe the friends have a little less, you can set up the policy so that if somebody comes in or a device comes in, they get a certain set of policies. It's sort of an automated way of, of doing the whole OAuth to Facebook, you know, uh, Google authentication and, uh, type thing. And I think this would be a tremendous thing to see happen. Uh, it would make a lot, of the, uh, a lot of these security issues uh, simpler. And then, of course, having something where the devices were updated regularly so that as vulnerabilities were found, that would be a tremendous improvement. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take for all of that to congeal in the market, uh, but people are going ahead and building these things and selling them, and people are buying them even today, even without all of that. So the, and the security state of affairs is pretty bad. I mean, basically, for consumers, it's, you know, you're really exposing yourself in a lot of ways by putting these things in. As an enterprise, uh, there are dedicated vendors, uh, you know, like Pacific Controls, Trimble in our case, but there's others out there that are building secure systems, relatively secure systems, and they're doing a lot of the, uh, the grunt work to make it better. Uh, so uh, then we talked about the IoT integration issues. Um, so now there's three use cases in the enterprise for IoT, in my belief. So, and you have to think of these as three separate use cases. One is if you're trying to build a building that has all the IoT automation in it, or you're looking at a factory and you want to use all the robots, everything, and it's all going to be integrated in IoT, then uh, you have a certain set of requirements. Obviously, it's super high criticality. This is your building. This is where people live and work. They can't, the thing can't go down. If it's your factory, you, know, you can't have the factory go down. Super high criticality, security, very important. This is, uh, you know, this is a set of requirements that are higher uh, quality, like almost all of them, you're not going to be sitting around replacing batteries, you know, every 10 minutes or whatever. You're going to want to um, have all this stuff powered. Uh, there's going to be, you know, a lot of different requirements for that. Then you have 
IoT devices that your employees have. So as a, as a business, if it might be finance, business, or whatever, you're, they're going to have different kinds of mobile devices of all sorts, eventually cars, other things that they will have that you will want to enable as IoT devices. There, you're more interested in flexibility. It's not as critical, right? And so there's a whole set of other sort of uh, different guidelines and requirements. And then you have uh, your customers who use IoT devices that you want to interact with, and you have a different set of requirements around there. You're interested in creating customer value at the same time as collecting the right information that you can leverage for, for some kind of business applicability. And so, uh, you know, you need a good UI because you're expecting customers to be dealing with it. It has to be really smooth and simple. Uh, so, you know, there's different requirements in each of these segments, and you have to really look at them in the enterprise as three different approaches and uses for, for IoT. Uh, and then there's the last case, which is if you're going to be either an OEM or, or subscribing, what are the use cases if you're, if you're going to be uh, providing services around IoT or uh, subscribing to services? If you look at now the end-to-end -end needs of IoT devices from the device itself out to the customer, here's uh, what I've categorized as the types of services that you need. And here's a reference architecture that I put together that describes. Uh, you can look at this uh, in more detail or ask questions or whatever. It, later, but it describes basically a, a layered architecture in which uh, you have a collection of data at a local hub. Usually it could be in the home at a local hub. That's the way most people expect. But we also expect it to go to the cloud and have cloud services. So there's going to be a multi-layered architecture. I don't know if it's going to be 10 layers. I think it's probably going to be two layers for most organizations and for most people is quite sufficient. Um, Maybe in some organizations I want to take all America IoT devices and aggregate it or something. But the point is, a lot of that would be done in the cloud. So in my uh, reference architecture, I have you know, both a local aggregation and orchestration, and then also in the cloud. So this is sort of the hub of a, of a uh, local or a cloud-based. Uh, these are the pieces that you need. And uh, now, uh, this is, we don't have enough time to go through this in very much detail, but the typical uh, architecture for IoT devices in the enterprise is a mesh architecture. This is also turning out to be in home. And a mesh architecture is like, like the internet. It has a huge advantage that devices talk to each other. And as a result, uh, they, since they don't have to talk to a central hub and they don't have to talk to the cloud, if there's a loss of connectivity or if a device fails, you can simply talk to the next device. In fact, you're probably sending the message to everybody, and everybody's getting the message because it's published, subscribed. So all the messages are being distributed to the local devices. That means you can have lower power requirements because you don't require, you're not required to get all the way out to the cloud. You're not required. You can use simpler protocols, simpler uh, and lower powered solutions. It's very important in the IoT world that you keep the power down. So. Uh, you know, by having this connectivity, you increase reliability. It also means that every device doesn't have to have every function because you can depend on other devices and they can send you information or you can send information to them so that you can have an aggregation of devices which provides the functionality. You don't have to have each device have all the functionality you want. So that's, all of those things reduce the cost, improve the, the, uh, co you know, the efficiency, the quality or, or whatever, and you know, the overall reliability of the network. So the, the mesh network, the publish subscribe network, it's a huge, huge advantage in this. And undoubtedly, the way that all works then is you end up with some local hubs and you want to replicate them for reliability, especially if you're in an uh, industrial environment. And then all of that aggregates up to a cloud where you make decisions. I was going to talk about two use cases. Uh, and you know, with only a couple minutes left, well, actually, we have some extra because I think um, there's an overflow. But uh, my favorite IoT example is Tesla. Uh, I own a Tesla, and I'm very enthusiastic. I, Consumer Reports has a 99% customer satisfaction for two years in a row. I'm part of the 99%, glad to say. Uh, I'm very happy with the car. Uh, it, it is an uh, example of IoT done right. Uh, the car is fully integrated, meaning all the devices, everything in the car is connected to the central uh, you know, device management. And uh, Tesla itself receives all the telemetry from the car. Uh, as well as giving me the ability to access the car through my uh, phone, through my uh, pad, iPad, or other ways. Uh, the watch, they have a watch application now. You can control your car from the, from the watch. Um, it's, it's an incredible thing, but also one of the big things is the ability to upgrade the car. I get upgrades every couple of weeks. Uh, some of these upgrades do things like uh, figure out to 
for the suspension or for the suspension system to subscribe to the GPS. So the suspension system knows where I am, and depending on where I am, it will raise and lower the suspension. So when I get home, it knows, and it, it figured this out by itself, which is really interesting to me. This is really smart. It figured out that when I got home, I like to raise my suspension, uh, so because my driveway is kind of steep. So now it does it automatically. That feature came to me maybe about six months ago. There, I've gotten new features every, every few weeks, every month or so. I get new features in the car. It's great. I've never had a car that improves as, as you go forward. Uh, so uh, it's an incredible uh, genius. The, the, all of the telemetry that feeds back to tele Tesla is used to improve the efficiency, the performance of the car, and I get updates that do that. Uh, they also learn about the reliability of components. Uh, they can detect from the big data when certain components are failing, if maybe you should replace that component, or they should stop using that component and replace it with another one. They can learn a lot that other car manufacturers can't. So now when you think about how does Tesla do all this, well, 60% of their employees are software engineers. Now this is a problem for a lot of the companies out there that are, that are thinking about IoT. Say the other car companies, for instance, uh, is an example. Ford only has 2% of their employees as software engineers. How are they going to build the same kind of interfaces, the same kind of integration? When they build a car, they tend to build a car that's basically the regular car with a battery added in. Or, uh, you know, they put a computer and they put the, the internet connection. But if the car is not connected itself, and if it's not, uh, you know, able to, to get up, what's the point of an update if there's nothing to update? If there's no <laughs> actual software that runs all these devices and connects them all, then there's no point of getting an update, right? What can you update? Uh, so you need the fact that all these things are connected. Do they know how to build a car like that? I don't, I don't know. I mean, only 2% of their, their employees are software engineers. I have a feeling this is the ultimate differentiation of Tesla, is their, uh, their understanding of how to integrate these devices. And that's, that gets to the central issue of what an IoT platform benefit is and, and how it works. And uh, the connected car proves this uh, tremendously. So uh, this is an architectural description of uh, how a connected car could work. Uh, and then another example case I have here is connected construction. Trimble, one of our customers, is, using, is, is a user of uh, our technology to build all this. And they, ha they implement a number of markets. Um, WSO2 connects people, devices, and application together to solve a connected problem for the world uh, and connected businesses. Uh, we help you with all of this technology by integrating all these pieces together like no other open source vendor does. Uh, if you look at Gartner and Forrester's descriptions of what the entire sweep of application technology is, we fit in all of the boxes. So we have pieces for the entire platform that Gartner and, and, uh, and Forrester call uh, a platform, and that includes IoT. So it's the complete enterprise middleware solution. Everything is in there. Thanks for listening. I mentioned my blog again. I think there's a lot of interesting things there. I'm talking a lot about IoT as well as finance and other things. So um, thank you very much. That's it.